Ever since they became a part of our ancestors' lives, dogs have been forever bound to humans, through thick and thin. Known for their fierce loyalty and their appetite for belly rubs, it's no wonder that the Canaanites have had such an important role in all mythologies across the world. And none more important than the keeper of our eternal souls. After all, man's best friend has proven itself over and over throughout the millennia with difficult jobs. Why would this be any different? Nowadays, dogs have many difficult jobs, such as digging a World War I trench under my grapevines, or randomly sitting in water even though they're supposed to drink from there, or wearing dumb clothes, but back in the day they had it much harder, believe it or not. From the Aztec Xolotl to the good old jackal-headed Anubis to the Norse Gunner, various canads have had ties to the underworld. But very few of them approach the fame of this episode's protagonist, Cerberus. But before we separate fact from fiction about this iconic hellhound, how did we get from this... to this? According to current fossil evidence, the first real canids appear around 40 to 36 million years ago, depending on the source, in North America. They soon proved themselves to be quite successful, and shortly after their appearance, they split into three distinct subfamilies during the Eocene Epoch. The Hesperocyonae, which were the oldest form, these early doggo relatives had long limbs and they kind of ended up looking a lot more like weird weasel cats. Also, fun fact that you'll never use in your life, they had fully retractable claws, just like cats. The Borophaginae, aka bone-crushing dogs, came soon after, and I believe the name is self-explanatory here. They also gave rise to the biggest dog ever, well, relative, Episcion, which could weigh over 200 kilograms, according to some research. Literally the chonkiest boy ever. And around 30 million years ago, give or take, the Canine finally appear on the world stage and they were here to stay. Thanks to their great evolutionary adaptations, such as even longer legs for running prey down or diverse teeth, they were extremely successful. Unfortunately, the Hesperocyonae went extinct approximately 14 million years ago and the bone crushers died out fairly recently in geological terms, around 2 million years ago. Meanwhile, canines survived and thrived. When it comes to the heroes of our story, it's hard to determine the exact time they show up in our lives, but what we do know is that dogs descend from a grey wolf subspecies that ended up hanging around humans a little bit too much. At first, they would eat scraps from human meals, and they would keep moving closer and closer to our camps, and at the beginning humans didn't really have a use from this mostly one-sided partnership, but obviously it greatly benefited the canines. Over a long period of time, the wolves started to change with their behavior, appearance and diet, and we can see the divergence occurring between, let's say, 40,000 to 20,000 years ago, give or take. Despite all the modern technology and research, it's still hard to determine the exact moment dogs became actual domesticated dogs as we know them, but we can place it between 14,000 to 20,000 years ago. And to give even more information, genetic analysis of about 27 ancient dog remains have revealed that at least five major ancestry lineage had diversified by 11,000 years ago, which should tell you how widespread dogs actually were. No matter when or how it happened, the important thing is that dogs were forever bound to humans, and they would go wherever we went across the globe. Dogs were extremely useful as hunting companions, guardians, and well, the most important role, just being a friend when you need one. There are many burial sites found where dogs were given human-like burials, which shows that they were extremely loved and respected. There are even mixed human and dog burials where owners were buried together with their pets. As an example, the Bon Oberkastel remains of the Magdalenian culture, around 14,000 years ago, shows two owners buried with a seven-month deceased puppy and another older dog. Dogs are just awesome. No wonder humans respected them so much in and out of mythology. And the best example is Kerberos, feared for his embodiment of the feral dog, yet honored and respected as the guardian of the dead. Cerberus, or the Hound of Hades, for obvious reasons. I mean, come on. Humans can own dogs, Martians can own dogs, even the Lord of the Underworld can own a dog. 
Interestingly enough, Hades was not very popular amongst the Greeks for obvious reasons, and we know a lot about him in his realm and his appearance thanks to the shocking popularity of Cerberus. Hades' name would very rarely, if ever, be spoken as it was assumed that you would draw his attention and you kinda want to avoid death, you know, common sense? In essence, Hades was like a certain he that should not be named, so the Greeks had to come up with a more benevolent name. Like Pluton or Zeus Chthonios. Even with this change, Hades would very rarely receive sacrifices because what's the point of trying to bargain with F? You already know you lost before you even began. I don't know, maybe if you wanted somebody dead like really badly? But as hateful and as scheming as Hades was, he loved his doggo like all owners should, and no wonder that he would have the most important role, guarding the entrance to the underworld and preventing any souls from leaving without Hades' permission, and in most cases, preventing any living to enter. The last thing the newly arrived dead would see before being sent off to judgment was Cerberus, forever guarding the gates. In some sources, he is friendly and protective towards his flock, but if you were to try and escape back to the world of the living, yeah, he would just straight up devour your immortal soul. And you really thought that was a good idea, didn't you? When it comes to the age of the myth, the only thing that's certain is that it predates Homeric times, as he mentions the Hound of Hades without giving him an actual name. The first real written information on Cerberus comes from Isiodos in his Felgonia, as is to be expected. Cerberus had quite the pedigree. After all, his father was the infamous Typhon, the snake-like monstrosity forever imprisoned beneath Mount Etna, or Kilikia, or you just know, the depths of Tartarus. His mother, the creepy yet apparently very seductive Ehidna, another half-serpentine monstrosity that gave birth to many wicked creatures of myth, as you can see in the family tree. I assume you're seeing some sort of a snake pattern here, right? His brother, Orphros, was a two-headed dog with a snake tail, and if you thought it ended there, another one of Cerberus' close siblings, the Hydra, was pretty much a full snake, and if you want to learn more about the Hydra, check it out that video. You thought the good boy was saved though, right? Well, think again. Here's where things get messed up. First of all, Cerberus was not a dog. It was a monstrous spawn of the underworld that just happened to be in the shape of a dog because he wanted belly rubs, but we don't care about that. No, that's boring, he's a dog, discussion over, I don't care. Besides his general canine body shape, Cerberus had some extra additions thanks to his serpentine heritage. Now, I hope you're ready for a lot of information you'll never use in a day-to-day -day conversation, but you're already here, might as well listen, right? According to Essior, he had 50 heads and a multitude of snakes running down his body, and on top of that, a venomous viper tail. Pindaros describes Cerberus as having 100 heads. Now, where does it end? Many more sources appear to conflict the number of heads. As an example, a lost archaeological artifact from Argos depicts Cerberus with one head and many snakes sprouting from his body. Euphorion of Alcides gives him multiple snake tails and eyes that glowed with hellfire. And also, Interestingly enough, according to him, Cerberus is the origin of the infamous Wolf's Bane plant. Let's just say he vomited on the ground and it kinda bloomed up. All werewolves hate him, I guess. To make things even crazier, some loonies thought that Cerberus was a giant multi-headed viper just like the Hydra because, metaphors aside, the real-life hounds of Hades were vipers because you know what? Back in the day, if you get bitten, you're 99% dead. Yeah, no joke, we'd be having another multi-headed snake instead of a good boy if this was more popular. You thought we were done? No, no, no. The Romans, who were also big fans of Cerberus, depicted him in different ways. Virgilius, in his Aeneid, describes him as a gigantic monster with many backs and snakes around his throats, while Horatius gives him only one dog head and a hundred snake heads. Thankfully for all of us, writers and artists started depicting Cerberus with two, and ultimately three heads alongside the many snakes on his body, and this pretty much became uniform thanks to Pseudo Apollodorus in his Bibliotheca. Also, we could probably say with 100% certainty that furry artists were not really paid that much in Greece, so they kinda didn't really want to put in the effort. Egypt, however... When it comes to assuming the breed is where things get a little bit tricky. You have to remember, dog breeds in the strictest term are a relatively modern concept. 
Back then, the dogs would appear more varied even if we did have some breeds, and no dog was as strong, brave, or famous in ancient Greece and Rome as the Molossian Hound from Epirus. It was a very powerful mastiff breed, and it is the inspiration for many depictions of Cerberus with good reason. If you've seen a Mastiff, you don't want to get mauled by that. Later on, some sources would give Cerberus a lion-like mane, and the appearance would shift over more towards the modern Rottweiler, but essentially, the beauty of mythology lies in its freedom of interpretation. We can assume that everyone could view Cerberus in a different way. Once you were dead and your soul reached the gates of the underworld, perhaps there would be a giant demonic dog with venom dripping out of its mouth or mouths. Perhaps there would be a brave Molossian hound waiting for you to pass. Or perhaps you would be greeted by a long-lost friend who's been waiting for you all these years. And ignore theoretically he's got free heads now and a lot of snakes, the little chubby boy still wants belly rubs. As you probably guessed by now, Cerberus was extremely popular with both Greeks and Romans, so there's a lot of writing about him. The Twelfth Labor of Heracles is all about Cerberus, and for your information, we'll cover all twelve labors in depth on this channel, so now before I directly read from Pseudo Apollodorus, we'll sum up the quest. Heracles was sent to bring Cerberus to the surface, something that was considered impossible. He went to get initiated in the Eleusinian Mysteries to be able to enter and exit the underworld alive, and he succeeded. He found the entrance, and thanks to divine intervention, he reached Hades. He allowed him to take Cerberus only if he would not hurt him. See? He does care. A twelfth labor imposed on Heracles was to bring Kerberos from Idis. Now this Kerberos had three heads of dogs, the tail of a dragon, and on his back the heads of all sorts of snakes. When Heracles asked Pluton for Kerberos, Pluton ordered him to take the animal provided he mastered him without the use of the weapons which he carried. Heracles found him at the gates of Acheron, and, caused in his cuirass and covered by the lion's skin, he flung his arms round the head of the brute. And though the dragon in its tail bit him, he never relaxed his grip and pressure till it yielded. So he carried it off and ascended through Troizen. The Dimitri turned Ascalphos into a short-eared owl, and Heracles, after showing Kerberos to Eurystheus, carried him back to Idis. As with all stories, there are some differences. Some sources say that Heracles got pissed at Hades and he shot a stone arrow or threw a rock at him. Some sources say he paraded Cerberus all over Greece. And there's something that even says that he killed the Cerberus. But we ignore those for the most part for a good reason. Either way, Cerberus canonically survived and we see him again appearing with Orpheus. Now, if ancient Greece was like Dungeons and Dragons, Orpheus was a max level bard that rolled a nat 20 at everything he did. Seduction? Yeah, no problem. Making animals sing and dance like in a Disney movie? Yeah, you get the point. He fell in love and married Eurydice, but this was not the last. One day she was just, you know, minding her own business, playing in the forest, and she was chased by an, uh, let's say, unwanted suitor. There are a few different versions of the myth, but she ends up being bitten by vipers and dies. Orpheus was really heartbroken, so he decided to do something somebody probably thought of by now, but never had the balls to do. He would go into the underworld and get his wife back. He actually did the impossible. He charmed Cerberus with his music and probably gave him a good belly rub while he was at it. Sadly, the tale of Orpheus will be covered in another episode, but let's just say that things kind of end up really bad for him, and I mean really bad. Cerberus once again appears in the epic Aeneid written by the Roman Virgilius. In Book 6, Aeneas, the mythical Trojan ancestor of Rome, descends into the underworld and with the help of a priestess of Apollo manages to get past him. Because he got baited by a honeyed loaf of bread with sleeping herds stuffed in it. Yeah, that's a good boy. Here, Kerberus, with triple-throated roar, made all the region ring, as there he lay, at a vast length in his cave. The Sibyl, then seeing the serpents rife around his neck, threw down a loaf with honeyed herbs, imbued in drowsy essences. He, ravenous, gaped wide his three fierce mouths and snatched the bait, crouched with his large backs loose upon the ground, and filled his cavern floor from end to end. Aeneas through hell's portal moved, while sleep its water buried. Then he fled that shore of Stygian dream, whence travelers near return. There are many more writings about Cerberus. He was a great hit in antiquity, as we've seen by now, extremely popular. But it doesn't end here. 
There are writings and artwork throughout the Middle Ages and long after, as an example, Dante Alighieri writes about Kerberus in his Inferno. But what is his legacy? Well, for starters, Cerberus is definitely the main reason why Hellhounds are so popular in media. Even though nowadays the generic hound is going to be single-headed, it's still inspired by the concept of Cerberus. And when we're not talking about copies, we have the real deal. Cerberus continues to fascinate people and as such he appears in movies, video games, comic books, everything you can think of really. He also used to give his name to a constellation that was sadly merged with the Hercules constellation, but it is what it is. All dogs go to heaven, but not this one apparently. Nah, who are we kidding? Cerberus is without a doubt worth of immortality as one of the most iconic and impactful creatures of mythology worldwide. And here's a list of some sources if you would like to read about Cerberus yourself or mythology in general. Hey, it's pretty cool. Go for it. Well, there you go. I hope you learned something about Cerberus and I hope you're still alive because if you're not, you're probably chatting with him right now. This is just the start. We've got a lot more mythological creatures, gods, stories to cover. So stick around, stay tuned. It's going to be a lot of fun. Your continued support is very appreciated and I'm having a lot of fun doing this, believe me. If you've got a great idea what kind of mythical creature or deity you would like to see or even a story, write in the comments and you know what, if I can't decide, I guess I'll just coin flip. And until the next time, try not to talk about the Lord of the Underworld cause he's probably gonna kill you if you say his name. Yeah, just don't. <laughs>